Okay, so how is everyone today? Good. So, we've been to the computer lab once. Exciting times. Uh, and uh, I've graded your, well, I've made one pass, a few passes of grading on your assignments. Many of you, maybe all of you, <laughs> received messages on GitHub. So any questions about that? The last day of August. Any questions about any of that? Yeah? How often do you regrade like as we submit? Several times a week. Both. <laughs> what what happens is, in case you're just interested, is that I have a, is that for, for each one of you there's a repository. And then, uh, so I, I have, I wrote a program which grades your program. So my program goes and fetches all of, all of each of your files. And then I check, I keep track of has, has any change been made. So if no change has been made in your file, then by definition, your grade couldn't possibly change that in result. So, both. Yes? Is there any way we can do our program homework at home? Or yeah, you can do it at home. But uh, to, 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 to get that done at home, you'll need to successfully install GitHub Desktop or some, some way to get, some way to get the files from GitHub and also MATLAB. And uh, you can install MATLAB. MATLAB is an is a outrageously expensive piece of software, but uh, because you're a student, you can use Ma UTD's MATLAB license. Yes? Also, with the student discount, it's $14. <laughs> that's, you know, that's how they get you, right? <laughs> And so what happens is, uh, so I agree, it's probably $49, but you can only use it so long as you're a student. And then if, say, you go on and start a business and you wish to do some engineering or whatever work with MATLAB, then they'll charge you like $1,500 per seat per year. <laughs> then they hit you good. So they, that's how they get you, right? <laughs> I wouldn't have used MATLAB for this class, but it, they, that choice wasn't given to me. I would have used something else. Uh, probably Lisp. Lisp okay. That would have been my preference. Other questions? Yes? How often are we, are we going to have that whole barrage of emails a week? Well, if you submit a whole bunch of unformatted files every week, <laughs> then yes. <laughs> if you submit a whole bunch of files that are more or less correct and don't have a lot of formatting errors, then no. Yes? You said the other one was called Lisp? Lisp, yeah. Is it similar to MATLAB? No. <laughs> well, yes, in, in a certain technical sense, all programming languages are formally equivalent. But, you know, in a, in a, in a different sense, no, they're not very alike. <laughs> other questions? Yes? Second question. Uh, I use a Linux computer, and yeah? uh, I'm wondering what does MATLAB have, is there like a, what, is MATLAB available for Linux? Yes. So the, the MATLAB that I, I, I run Linux, and the MATLAB that I'm running is on Linux. So as I understand it, you can probably install uh, a copy of Linux on, on your machine, but if you're already running Linux and accustomed to that, then you can just SSH to another machine on campus that already has it installed and run it there. And I'd be glad to help you figure out how to do that. Other questions? Uh, there are servers uh, like cs1.ut.us.edu that you can just say can do it and have installed? I don't know okay. because, because those particular machines are um, controlled by the computer science okay. department. I was just curious if you. Uh, but there are, you know, I, <laughs> I happen to work in the math department. Okay. With like little fiefdoms all over the campus. Other questions? Yes? 
It's not on there yet. I need to, I need to set them up. I'll, I'll set them here. Let me make myself a note. The one on the website, the right one? I'll set them today. And I'll make an announcement. This is my official filing system here. <laughs> Other questions? Okay. So the last thing that we talked about last time was uh, figuring out how to um, compute the product of n and x, where n is natural and x is real. Okay, so can someone remind us what natural means? In this class, it's all positive integers and zero. Yes, so the non-negative integers, right? So, and then real just means I any, any other number. <coughs> Okay, so we did that doubling trick, and by now, you've just turned this in. Okay, uh, that, that was over that. The neat thing about it is, is, it, is this kind of technique works for, for any natural. So if you wanted to multiply by, say, let's take a power of 2, a relatively big power of 2, like in the programming homework, like 1,000, or 1,024 uh, is a power of 2. That's 2 to what exponent? 10, right? 2 to exponent 10 is 1,024. So in, the, in that programming homework, I asked you uh, to write a function that multiplies by 1,000, but you're only allowed to use addition. Okay, so you had to end up more or less doing something like, okay, by doubling enough times, I can get 512x, but if I double one, once more, then I'll have 1,024x, and so I would have overshot, right? I, made, I went too far. Okay, so then what do you, what do, you do? Yeah, you keep track of all the previous ones. And you take, okay, here's the one that was 512x's. To it, I'll add the one that was 256x's. And then that, that right now is on the order of 760. So that's not enough to be 1,000. So we'll have to add to that the one that was 128x's, et cetera until, oh, I, finally, we, we've got a thousand of them. Pretty neat, huh? So, what, 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 among the things we're going to do today is we're going to try and write a function. We're going to try and write a function that will uh, do this for any n. Okay, so then you wrote a function that did it exactly for a thousand, and another function that did it exactly for 16. So we want to have a function that will do it for any n whatsoever. Okay. Now, to get that done, we have to talk about some other things first. So, as a reminder, <coughs> the well-orderedness well-orderedness of the naturals. So does anybody know what that means? That that adjective, well-orderedness, yeah? Uh, it's any non-empty subset of the natural numbers has at least one element. Or, no, a least element. That's it. Every <coughs> non-empty <coughs> subset of the naturals has a least element. In fact, has a unique least element. So, <clears throat> uh, for example, uh, I could give you, say, this set. We can consider the naturals as being a subset of the naturals. <laughs> right? Trivial subset. So, um, are the naturals non-empty? Yes. How do you know they're not empty? <laughs> well, because they, for example, they contain 2370. 2370 is a natural, so 2370 is in there. Okay. So it's not empty, right? So then, there mu as a result, the naturals must have a least element. What's the least element of the naturals? Zero. Okay, so, so this, 
according to this property above, the least one is zero. Okay, suppose that, uh, so this is, this is one. Uh, how about two? Let's consider the set, uh, the set, this is kind of a triviality, but I want to make sure you all understand this. Uh, the set of all n, which are in the naturals, uh, such that, <coughs> so this is such that, <coughs> the units digit is 7. Okay, so that's the abstract description of it. So let's let's write uh, the set. So so, uh, what are some of the elements that are in the set? Seven, seventeen, twenty-seven. That's in there. So is twenty-three, uh, seventy-seven, right? And lots of other things. Okay, so uh, is this a non-empty set? It is non-empty. Um, does it have a least element? Yeah. Yes, of course it does by the well-orderedness property. And moreover, y you can tell me exactly what it is. So what, what is it, the least element? Seven. Seven, Seven. Seven. good. <clears throat> okay, now, why do we need, why do we need uh, non-empty? Why is non-empty required? Yeah, there can't be at least one, right? There can't be a least element. Okay. So now, to make sure, you may think this is kind of weird or even a triviality, but I want to point out to you, uh, for example, let's consider the set uh, 0 to 1 as a subset of the reals. 0 to 1 as a subset of the reals. And then, of course, when you draw this, usually it's drawn in this kind of stylistic way as a line segment uh, with an open circle at 0 and an open circle at 1. So this is a subset of the reals. Uh, does this subset have a least element? No. No, it does not. It doesn't have a least element. So why not? Right. So why is 0 not the least element of this set? Because it's not in the set. So zero can't be the least element. So it couldn't possibly be zero. And neither could something over here like negative four. Negative four is not the least element because negative four is not in the set. So you might say, well, okay, let's just get really close and say <coughs> that one is the least element. But what's, what's wrong with that argument? Right, if we were to say that, okay, this x right there, that, that one's the least one. Well, you can immediately tell me a formula for an even lesser one. Yeah. X over 2, right? X over 2 is also in there. And the thing is, is that works for any X that's positive that you could possibly offer as a candidate. So, so this set has no least element. No least element. So I'm just pointing this out to you so that you don't think that the fact that subsets of the naturals have least element is sort of a triviality, because it, it is simply not the case that all s subsets of the reals have a least element, because here's one that doesn't. Okay. <clears throat> so while that's stewing around in your head, uh, I want to remind you of uh, something that you learned in grade school. So um, <clears throat> in grade school, you learned how to do the following kind of thing. Uh, like you, you learn how to do this in third grade or, or earlier. So let's divide, say, uh, 123 by 5. And I want you to clearly uh, state the quotient and remainder. Okay. 
So do you remember doing this? So if your third grade teacher was like my third grade teacher, then they said something like the following. Okay, class, 123 is in the house. Oh, that's right. You gotta write these a little bit further apart. One, two, three is in the house. And then five is outside of the house. And five wants to come in. <laughs> <laughs> this is how it went for me. Okay, I'm reliving it. So, uh, well, you consider the digits from the, from the left. So how many times can five go into one? It cannot, right? You can't take away a group of five from, from a group of size one. Okay, so then you can't do anything with that one, so then you uncover one more digit and you ask, okay, how many, how many uh, uh, groups of five can you take away from 12? You can take away two such groups. So you put a two over the rightmost digit that you were able to deal with, and then what do you do with this two? Right, the two jumps off the house, wee, and then multiplies the five on the way down. And then you get 10 and write that here and do what? Subtract. Subtract. <clears throat> okay. And then this is a 10, but now that we're in university, we understand that this really means 100. That's what that really means. So we're going to ignore that rightmost digit for the moment and perform that subtraction and get what? 2, right? And then before we carry down, you need to look at that and say, well, could I have taken another group of 5? No, I couldn't have taken a, another group of five. And how can I tell that I could not have taken another group of five? Five's more than two. Okay. So then now that we've verified that, then now we can carry down this other digit. And now ask, okay, how many groups of five can we take away from 23? Four such groups. <coughs> Write the four on top of the house over the rightmost digit that you just consumed, the four jumps off the house, hits the five on the way down, multiplies the five, and you get a 20. And then what do you do with that 20? Subtract. Subtract. Uh, doing that, we get three. And then have a look at that. So did we take away the correct number of groups? How can we tell that we took away the correct number of groups? Because three is less than five. If this digit right here were a five, then that would say that we didn't take away enough groups, right? Because we could have taken away one more if that was a five. If it was a six, we, c we still could have taken away another group, et cetera. So now, uh, in fourth grade, you learn to continue doing this and say decimal point, blah, blah, blah. We're not doing that. Here, we stop, okay? So then, what is the quotient? Yeah, quotient. Quotient is 24. This is the number of groups that you could make, number of groups of size 5. And then the remainder is uh, what? 3. So that's what, after you finish this procedure, that's how many things uh, you couldn't uh, form into a group. Okay, now all of these things can be, all of these numbers, these four numbers, 1, 23, 5, 24, and 3, they can all be combined in a single equation into this equation. 1, 2, 3 is <coughs> uh, 5 multiplied by 24 plus 3. Okay, now each one of these has a name. <coughs> This, the group size, what's its math name? The divisor. And then the, these, these math names are already up there, right? So this one is the quotient. This one is the remainder. And then What's the name of the one on the left-hand side? The dividend. Which is, in my opinion, unfortunate, 
uh, because now we have two things that start with letter D, and historically students always mix up divisor and dividend. So dividend is the thing that is being divided up. The divisor is what's doing the dividing. So I hope you remember this. So one way, one way you can uh, teach this, this, this is taught in third grade, but I can tell you, I can tell you that I was able to teach this to my, to my pre-kindergarten child very easily, very easily. Okay, because the way that you can uh, do it is you just frame it in, in terms of something that they're very interested in. Okay? So the way that you can frame this is you just say, okay, child, <laughs> offspring. <laughs> Here we have on the table, we have 23 M&Ms. Already rapt attention. Like, I like where this is going. Okay? <laughs> we have 23 M&Ms. What I want you to do is I want you to make as many groups of size 4 as possible. And then when you're finished making groups of size 4, I want you to count how many groups of size 4 you were able to make, and I want you to tell me how many ones were left over that you couldn't make a group of size 4. And if you do it correctly, you get to eat the ones that are left over. <laughs> <laughs> At that point, you will see a 4-year-old become a scientist. <laughs> right there. <laughs> Extreme concentration. Okay, so we're going to write a function that does, that does exactly this, okay, the, 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 pre, the, the, the preschool algorithm. So this one that we did, we're going to write an algorithm that does this a little later, okay. This one, this one actually, from, from a programming point of view, is, is a little bit advanced, a little bit, but we're going to get to it. What right now we're going to do uh, is, is the preschool thing, okay. We're going to take away one group at a time. <clears throat> but now that that's stewing in your head, let's get back to the to the uh, to the abstract business, okay? About well-orderedness. So <clears throat> here's a remark. So what do I want to call these things? So let, let n be a natural, and let d be a natural. <coughs> and there's a requirement on d that d is greater than 0. OK, so n is any natural, d is a positive natural. Then. There exists, so that, that symbol means exists. And then furthermore, in math, uh, very often we're, we're, we're interested in the existence of something. Uh, and then slightly less often, we're interested in saying that there is one, but not only is there one, there is only one. Right? There can't be any more. So when you want to say that there exists and this thing is unique, does anyone know how you write that in in? Crazy math language? Exclamation An exclamation point. So, so that doesn't mean exists. Right? It, doesn't, it doesn't mean that. It means there's just one. It's factorial. Right. <laughs> there exists a unique Q and R in the naturals with zero less or equal to r less than, strictly less than, uh, d, <coughs> such that n is d times q plus r. So can someone tell us what this has to do with the with the thing that we wrote on the previous page? What does this have to do with, with, with this? It's exactly this formula, right? It's saying that 
to put this in less stilted math language, it's saying that if you have any number, any natural number of M&Ms, okay, and then you have a group size, and the group size is a positive natural, right? It wouldn't make any sense to say, break this into groups of size zero, okay? That, that's, we're, that doesn't make any sense, logical sense to talk about. So if you're going to take some number of M&Ms, even zero M&Ms, even zero, uh, then, <clears throat> and you're going to break them into uh, this group size, then you can find a unique, uh, a unique quotient and remainder that does this. You'll be able to say that we were able to make exactly Q number of groups, and after we made Q number of groups, there were exactly um, R left over. Okay, good. So now we want to we want to establish that this is in fact the case. Okay, we want to show that this is true, that there really is a Q uh, and there really is an R. So let's consider. <coughs> I want you to consider the following, uh, the following set. So we've got the set that is, that contains n. It contains n. It also contains n minus d. It also contains n minus twice d. It also contains n minus three times d dot, 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 all the way down. So this is a set that contains infinitely many elements. Okay, this set contains infinitely many elements. Which is to say, this is the set uh, of all <coughs> little n in the naturals such that uh, little n is equal to n minus kd, where k is a natural. OK. <clears throat> we'll call this set uh, A. Why not? This is set A. So for example, to make this clear, to give you an example, if big N was uh, 23, like when we were talking about M&Ms, and we said uh, that D is size 4, you're to make uh, groups of size 4, then the set A that we're talking about would be 23, because that would be in there. What would, it, following this pattern, what would be the next thing in there? 19, what would be the next one? 15, and then 11, and then what comes next? <laughs> 4? No. 4 is how much I'm taking away, so it would be 7, and then 3, and then negative 1, and then negative 5, etc. Okay? So that's the set that we're talking about. So is this a subset of the naturals? No. It's not a subset of the naturals. It's not a subset of the naturals. Uh, but it is a subset of the integers, right? So now let's define, let's define set B equal to set A intersect the naturals. What does that mean, sort of in plain language? Yeah, it, it's saying that, it's saying that, well, I want, I want B to be more or less just like A except I'm going to throw out all the negative numbers, if there are any. And of course there are, right? So we're going to take, we're going to take all the things in set A, but throw out the negative ones. Okay? So con continuing this example right here, what would set B be? 23. 19, 15, 11, 7, 3. And there wouldn't be any more because we threw out all the negative ones. And notably, notably, I'd like for you to observe that B is a subset of the naturals, isn't it? 
It has to be a subset of the naturals because we intersected it with the naturals. Now, another thing I'd like for you to consider is that this set B, it's a subset of the naturals, but is it, are we sure that it's non-empty? So, I mean, this, per this particular B that I'm giving as an example is non-empty. But what I'm saying is that according to, here's the definition of A, and here's the definition of B. We don't necessarily have any guarantees that it's yeah, not empty. Or, 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 or do we? It'll always have capital N in it. Capital N is the first one that's in there. And N is a natural. So do you observe that capital N is always in B? Yeah. So note that N is in B. And therefore, we can conclude that B is non-empty. It's still fine, because what, what B does is it throws out, it throws out the negative things. Is zero negative? It isn't. Zero is not negative. So zero would be in there. So if, if capital N was zero, then set B would be zero. <coughs> set B would be zero. So B is non-empty. Therefore, B is a non-empty subset of the naturals. A non-empty subset of the naturals. So what can we invoke? The, we can invoke the well-orderedness of the naturals and say that B has a least element. <coughs> this least element, this least element, uh, we'll call it R. And in fact, B has a unique least element. We'll call it R. That is to say that R is equal to N minus KD uh, for some specific K that is in the naturals. And now what's the next thing I'm going to say for those that are paying close attention? We defined R. What do we have yet to define? No, D, D was given. Q. Q is what we have yet to define. What's Q? K. It's K. <clears throat> B has a least element, call it R, and we'll define Q is K. There it is. There it is. So we know for sure now that this grade school thing that you, that you were always doing, dividing things, right? this procedure has to work. There is no way that it can fail. And there's no way that two people can follow two different, slightly different procedures and, and come to correct answers and those answers be different. That's not possible either. Right? As, long as, you are, as long as you've done this properly, it doesn't matter it doesn't matter who's doing it or where they're doing it. Okay, this procedure will stop. And moreover, all such individuals will always come to the same answer. There's no way you can get to any, of, any other thing. Good. So now we don't have to worry about whether or not this is a questionable thing to be doing. <coughs> so that, that amounts to a mathematician's promise. Yeah, this, what we're doing makes sense. OK. <coughs> so now let's. Let's do the M&M &M game one more time. And I want you to kind of look at this uh, in a table point of view. So we're going to make a table. <clears throat> and we'll do it like this. So capital N, D, Q, and R. <clears throat> uh, 
So what I want you to imagine is that this is this represents uh, the M and M game, okay? But we're going to do it in the in the in the childhood way. So here we're saying that we start with twenty uh, twenty three M and M's. <coughs> start with twenty three M and M's, and we want to break them into groups of size four. And then the first thing that child does and says, okay, I currently have, I currently have zero groups, I currently have zero groups, and 23 are currently in the big pile. That's how much is left over. That's how much is left over. Is it possible for me to take away a group? How, do, how can I detect that it's possible for me to take away a group? because what remains is more than the group size. Okay, so then if, if we do that, then we will have made one group, so what do I need to do? Change Q to be one. We will have made one group, and now what remains? 19. Okay, one step. Now are we able to make a group? Okay, how do you detect that you're able to make a group? That what remains is more, greater or equal to the group size. Okay. So then we'll increment the number of groups and take away the group size from uh, what we have. Okay, so can you see? Uh, this column of Q's, the quotient, it's counting up. Click, 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 click. It's going up. And what remains is going down. Okay. So then 23, 4, we can take away a group. There would be 11. 23, 4, we can make a group. If we were to do that, there'd be 7. Twenty-three, four, we can make a group. If we were to do that, there'd be three. And now, finally, I ask the, the same question again, but now we get a different answer. Are we able to make another group? No. No, no because why? Because, because what remains, the, the pile that we're taking from, currently has three things in it, and the group size is four. Can you take away a group of size four from a group of size three? You cannot. This is where you terminate. So the answers are this one and this one. And what I'd like for you to uh, observe is that this kind of idea will work for any, uh, for any big N that's natural and any D that is positive natural. Okay, so then if I were to give you, it, less than M. It, it would work for, for any D whatsoever. Oh, okay. So I could say, uh, for example, suppose that, suppose that I give you 23 M&Ms and I want you to make groups of size 70. Okay. Then how many, how many oh, groups can so you make? Just, yeah, there are no groups, zero just the remainder of 23. You, you'd be able to make zero groups and you'd have 23 left over. Okay. Yeah. Other questions? This one, this one has to be natural. This one has to be natural and positive. Good. Any question about this? So now what we want is we want a function that does this, right? We sort of talked about it, made this little spreadsheet or whatever we have here, but now we want to write a function that does this. In fact, we're going to write two different kinds of functions that do it. Okay. So, in the first place, let's write a function that that uh, does that, that emulates this table as closely as possible. So, how many how many columns? That is to say, how many variables does this table have? Four. It's got four, right? It's got four. So we're going to have to write a function that has four variables. 
it's going to have four variables. So what do we want to call it? Divide. Divide? OK. Why not? How about D? Yeah. That way I don't have to write divide so many yeah, times. <laughs> Yeah. Let's define D of capital N, little d, Q, and R. OK. <clears throat> and what it's supposed to, how many things is it supposed to return? Two, two things, right? It returns two things. It returns a, a Q and an R. Okay. So how do we tell when we're finished? How do we tell when we've arrived at the answer? R is less. Yes, when R is less than D. So we want to. We're done when R is less than D. Okay. If we ever arrive at that condition, we're finished. So what is the answer in that case? Q and R. So in such a case, the answer is Q and R. That is to say that this, this clause that we just wrote, the clause that we just wrote, is equivalent to what we did when we got to the last row in this table. We noticed, oh, well, uh, well, R is less than D. So these are the answers, Q and R. There was nothing more to do. OK. So otherwise, otherwise what? The otherwise case is saying that, OK, it, it, it is in fact possible to uh, take one more group. So in, in this case, we'll need to recurse. We'll need to call ourselves again. And we'll need to give, um, we'll, we'll need to modify the arguments. So, so that is just what I'm, what I'm asking you is there are now four slots here, and I want you to tell me what goes in each one. One, two, three, four. In the middle, in the middle, in the middle. So, what's the new first argument? N. N. What's the new second argument? D. D. OK. So those are always going to stay the same. So those are straightforward. Now, what is the new third argument? Q plus, Q plus 1. Now, I agree that that's logically correct. But can anyone, in plain language, say why it simply must be Q plus 1? Because it's adding one more group that we've taken. Let me say it like this. Can someone phrase it in terms of M and M's? Right. Because that's saying that we were able to make one more group of M and M's. Okay, we, at, the, at the present time, we had Q groups, and we were able to make one more group. So one more group. OK. What is the new third, uh, fourth argument? R minus what? D. D. Why R minus D? Right. That's like saying that, well, at the present time, we have 15 M&Ms. I was instructed to take away groups of size 4. And once I do that and make a group of size 4, there's 4 less. So this is now R minus D. That's supposed to be an R. OK. So now I'm going to make a new function that, yes? Uh, well, specifically for that example, we didn't have a remainder of 0, but if, if, if r is 0, we have to make a new function. When r is 0, 
when r is zero, this case will be true because, because d is a positive natural and you would be asking, is zero less than this positive natural? The answer is yes. And then it would be q, whatever q is and zero. Okay, so now, uh, if we were to start, <clears throat> if we were to start uh, this, let's say we want to do the M&M &M game one more time and let's evaluate this function now. Let, let's do it according to this function evaluation. Suppose we want to divide divide 23 by 4. What are we supposed to um, what are we supposed to evaluate this function with? That is to say, what is the very first evaluation? D of what? 23 4 0 and 23. That's the first evaluation. Yeah, that's the first evaluation. So let's do it. So are we in the term of uh, the the uh, base case or the recursive case? Recursive. The recursive case, which is to say that this is the same as the evaluation of 23, 4, and what's the new third argument? 1, one. one and the new uh, fourth argument? 19. 19. Okay. So now, this one is uh, Q and that one is R. To evaluate this one, are we in the base case or the recursive case? Recursive, recursive case. And to be clear, for those of you who are not quite as comfortable yet, we'll call these cases one and two. To get from here to here, I used case one. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. And then, now this one, this will be D of 23 and 4. <coughs> and what are the new sec uh, third and fourth arguments? 2 and 15. And that used the recursive case, clause 2. And then this would be 23 and 4, and then 3 and 11. <coughs> which is the same as 23 and 4, 4 and 7, which is the same <coughs> as 23, 4, 5, and 3. So all of these that I just wrote relatively quickly, they all used the second clause. Now what? <coughs> Yeah, now we'll be in the first clause, the, the base case, the, the case that no longer recurses. So what's the answer? 5-3. Beautiful. Now, as a matter of style, as a matter of style, uh, functions that are, that are written in this way, they usually come with um, a partner, a partner uh, that goes like this. So we can define um, S of N and D, which is to say we want to divide, we want to divide capital N by little d, and we'll define this as, by definition, is the division of N, D, 0, and N. That way, that way, whoever calls the function the first time doesn't need to know they're supposed to do this. They can just do that. Okay, because no matter what, the way this starts, it's supposed to start with n, d, 0, and n. Okay, good. Any question about this one? Yes? Even in the recursive one, there's not actually any reason to pass the first argument, is there? So, you, you could... Uh, so I, I agree that in principle you, you could do this, but th that you could, you could uh, be without the 23. I agree with that. Uh, but I wanted to make it look like the table. Okay, notice that the 23 is sort of just along for the ride, and then it's never part of the answer. So in principle, 
you wouldn't even have to have it. Good. Other questions? Okay. Now let's rewrite this function again, except let's write it in uh, a slightly different way. Okay. So now I'm going to make a computation kind of with tables again, and I want you to um, think about how it works. So back to the M&Ms, I want you to imagine that instead of there being a, a single child, and you say, oh, do it, you know, with the M&Ms, okay, rather there's a sequence of, of children, and they're all in a row, and th they're all going to get, uh, they're, they're, all, they're all potentially have an M&M payout. Right? So, uh, the way we're going to do it is like this. All of them receive the same instructions. They receive the instructions as follows. You will be given a group of M&Ms. I want you to take away your group of size 4, if possible. Otherwise, uh, and, and, and if you can take away a group of size 4, do that and pass it to the next child. Okay, then they all do this. So the first one has 23 M&Ms, takes, <coughs> takes a group, passes what, what is left over, the 19, to the next child. Okay, then this child is able to take, a, take away a group. They take their group. They pass what remains to the next child. Okay, all the way down to the end, when the last child receives three, and the last child says, I'm not able to make a group. And now, after we do that, we're going to go through and say, okay, let's count the number of children who are, who are able to make a group. Okay, so we're going to think of the problem kind of like that. Okay. So here we go. <clears throat> So as a table, now we're going to have uh, we're going to have one less variable. Okay, so the the, the state of the previous thing uh, required require we had we were having four variables. Now we're going to have uh, just three. So they are n, <coughs> d, and r. No. No, I guess we I guess we do need four variables. Okay, that's fine. Q and R. Okay. So the first child receives twenty three M and M's. And they're instructed to uh, divide by 4. <coughs> they're instructed to divide by 4. Well, from here, from here, uh, the student the, or child or whoever is doing this says, can I take away a group of size 4? OK, I can. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to call or pass on to my colleague and say, OK, I want you now to do exactly this. And I want you to do it with the same four variables. <coughs> N, D, Q, and R. Except now, this, this one's been handed how many? This one's been handed 19. But still supposed to, still supposed to um, <coughs> make groups of size 4. And now this one asks, OK, is it possible for me to make a group of size 4? So is it possible for this one to do it? Yeah. yeah. So this one's going to hand it to the next one t and take away their group. <coughs> Okay, this one now has 15, still making groups of size 4. And this one asks themselves, self, 
am I able to take away? A group of size four? Yeah. So it gets handed to the next one. <clears throat> this one is handed 11. Still instructed to make groups of size four. <clears throat> So is this one able to make a group of size four? Yes. N, D, Q, and R. This one is handed seven. Still instructed to make groups of size four. Is this one able to make a group of size four? Yes. Now we're going to start going up, I guess. <clears throat> this one is finally handed how much? Three. <clears throat> and is instructed to make a group of size four. So this is the first one that's able to make a conclusion about anything. So this one is able to make the conclusion, OK, what's the quotient and remainder? How many groups am I able to make? Zero groups. And how much was left over when I did that? Three. Now the computation, computation starts going back. So what we're talking about is that there were one, two, three, four, five, six children all in a row. We made it to the sixth child, and the sixth child is able to, to conclude, I can't make any groups. And as a result of making no groups, there's three left over. Okay? And then this is reported back to the previous child, which is to say that this value of Q now comes back to that, and this value of r now comes back to the previous child. So this child now knows that the child next to me reported that there were zero groups and three left over. That's what the previous child reported to me. But I know that I took away my group, so I need, to, I need to add that in. So what's the real quotient according to this child? One. And then what's the remainder? No. Three, right? Because that last child, that's the child that, that actually was able to, to figure out what the remainder is. So now this child hands back their quotient to the previous child and says, OK, that's my quotient. That's my remainder. Eleven, four, one, and three. But this child remembers, oh, I was able to take away my, my group. And this child reported to me that the quotient was one. But since I took away a group, what's the real quotient? Two. two. And then the remainder is still three, because I know that guy at the end is the one that was able to figure out the real remainder. Now it just keeps going up. That is to say, this goes up. This goes up, this goes up, this goes up, this goes up, this goes up. And now let's quickly fill it all in. <clears throat> so 15, 15, 4, 4. Child below me said 2. I took away a group, so it's really 3. And this is uh, 3, because that answer is, was already correct. <clears throat> This is 19 and 4. This is 19 and 4. Child below me reported that there were three the remain and that the remainder is three, but I took away my group, so there's really one more than that. There's four, and I know that the remainder was correct. 23, 4, 23, 4. Child below me reported uh, four. This is three, but I took away my group, so I know that the real quotient is five. And the remainder is 3. Interesting. 
It's a different way to organize the computation anyway. Okay, it's a slightly different way. So let's, uh, let's write a function that does exactly this. Okay. <clears throat> Okay, so I guess we'll call this one D also to make things extra confusing. Okay, so N and D. D sub also. <laughs> D sub also. Yeah, or D prime. <laughs> the derivative of D. <laughs> I'm just going to write D. Fair enough. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so now let's think about it for a moment. Let's think about it for a moment. Uh, again, <clears throat> what's, what's the case uh, in which we're going to terminate? That is to say, we can take away nothing more. When n is less than d, right? Because remember, each child is just handed a pile. They're not keeping track of the remainder like we were 20 minutes ago. They're just handed a pile. So the on, there's only two things that child is comparing, is that is the first pile, is the pile bigger than the, than the, the, the group I'm supposed to make, uh, greater or equal, okay? So if n is less than d, if n is less than d, if I can't take away a group, then I immediately know the answer. It's, it's saying that q and r are equal to what? Zero and, Zero and n. Which is to say, I was able to take away no groups, and there were this many left over. Couldn't take, t couldn't take away any groups, and there were that many left over. OK. Now we have to make the recursive case. So now this is the otherwise case. Okay, <clears throat> so now the, ne the thing we're about to do is going to reflect the fact that the first time control, if you like, or focus, attention, is on a child, the child says, well, I'm not, I don't know what the answer is yet. I'm just going to do my part as, as control passes past me. So I get the pile, I can take, I can take a group, so I take the group and hand, and hand the action to the next child and then they do their thing. Okay? So there's there's two times where child is doing something. Okay? If if they're not at the end, if they're not this child. So the first time is that they take away their group and hand it to the next one and then they just wait patiently. Okay? So let's write that down. Let's write that down. So the first thing that they do is they say, "Well, I'm going to have to wait. I'm going to have to wait." So I'm calling this Q1. For the for the child uh, next to me to do their thing, so I'm going to call the next child, but I'm going to give them different arguments. Right? What are their arguments? N minus d. Now, why n minus d? Because that's saying that I took away my group. I took away my group, and I'm giving you less M and Ms than I was given. Okay. So then. Uh, with n minus d, and then d is the other argument. Because that because the child next to me needs to make groups of the same size, but only has that many to go. So suppose suppose that that happens. Okay, C control makes it all the way to the to the to the base case child, who is finally able to conclude. You can't make a group. You can't make a group of size four with three M and M's. You can't do it. So there's zero of them, and there were three left. And then that child reports that there were Q, uh, Q1 uh, groups, and the remainder was R. So now c control has, is passing back to that, to that child that was waiting patiently. And what is their answer? Their answer is that the real quotient and remainder 
is equal to whatever the child next to that one got plus one more because they're saying don't forget about my group don't forget about mine and the remainder is whatever the whatever that child said interesting so any question about this hmm so the other style let's 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 compare them The other style, is, as far as computation, was a little more straightforward, wasn't it? Because, because of all of this. So, not to put, it's a little imprecise to say this, but I want to explain to you the reason why this one seems like maybe conceptually a little easier to understand than that one. In the end, the answer is this, is that this one is doing the computation with four variables, and this one's trying to carry it out with just two. Okay, so the fact that this one has more, more room to maneuver itself, more room in which to work, that makes this one a little easier to understand than this one. Okay, but, but either, one, uh, either one can come up with the answer, and your, your, your one of your assignments from today will to do each of these. You're gonna have to do this one, and also you're going to have to do this one. Okay, good. So any question about uh, about these? Question? No, that's a stretch. Yes? Did you keep using the word group? Is that like extremely intentional? Like uh, like group theory? Yeah. No. no. I just I just mean group of size. Uh, I just mean that's that's the number of M and M's, like four. I mean, what, what if if I if I you know. If I'm feeling like it, maybe later in the semester we'll do some, some things that are related to group theory, but that's not what we're talking about here. Okay, good. So that means that uh, now that we've talked, we've explained that, that division, that is to say with quotient and remainder, division of integers, division of naturals, is a well-defined concept. Okay, and furthermore, we've, we've talked about two different, two different ways to compute them. So, so we, can, we can speak with impunity about it and not, not feel any shame that we haven't defined what, what it is we're talking about. So now I'm going to just quickly import uh, a few things that you already knew. Uh, so given n and d according to the previous definitions that n is a, is a natural and d is a positive natural, um, how, what, is, what is the phrase D is a proper divisor of big N? What does that mean? Is a rem it, there's, the remainder is zero. So, uh, D is called a proper divisor of N when the remainder is zero. Okay, two, <clears throat> n, and then mod, d, is congruent r. So that is to say that uh, you can think of this like an equals. It, 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 it does have three dashes, so it's not exactly equal. Uh, but um, this is pronounced out loud that n modulo d is r. So I could say, what is 23 modulo 4? 3, right? Because that's the remainder when you divide 23 by 4. I could also say, well, what's 103, mo uh, no, what's 104 modulo 5? 4. Because if you were to divide 104 by 5, you could make 20 groups and there'd be 4 left over. So what modulo is, it's kind of like the, 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 the function we just made, but it's saying, forget the Q. I'm not interested in it. I'm not interested in it. So it could be like that sequence of children all in a row, only we care about what the last one has to say. Okay. Yes? Is modulo a percent sign in MATLAB? Or is it no. In MATLAB, in MATLAB, uh, so in MATLAB, 
it is written as MOD uh, in comma D. Because what is the percent sign in MATLAB? A comment. Yeah. Comment. Uh, and then three is that in the specific case, when D is two, what are the when you're when you're dividing by two, what there's only two possible remainders. What are the two possible remainders? Zero and one. Zero and one. So if two is a proper divisor of something, that's such an important and common case that we have a name for such a big N. What are they called? Even, right? <laughs> okay. And then when when the remainder of division by two is not zero, that is to say one, that's also important and that's called what? Odd. odd. Okay. So I'm just going to write even and odd because I take that to be probably part of your experience by now. <laughs> <laughs> Almost surely. <clears throat> Darn, we have one minute. Okay. So here we go. We're just going to write the multiplication function. Okay, and I want you to think about it over the weekend. So suppose we want to multiply n by x. We want to multiply n by x. But we want to do it really, really quick, right? Because if, if n were 23, uh, 2370, then according to the previous way we wrote the multiplication function, you'd have to do 2,370 steps. That's a lot, right? So here we go. We can start out with some simple base cases. The answer is 0 when n is 0. That's easy enough. What's another easy one? Uh, it's x when n is 1. And now we're going to have two different recursive cases, two different ones. One of them is going to be when n is even. So how can we, how can we uh, recurse when n is even? Well, if n is even, then n over 2 is, also, is still an integer, right? And then we can write x plus x here, which is to say that, well, we'll just double x and half, half n, OK? And we can do this because we just got finished talking about division, OK? In the last case, when, it is odd, when little n is odd, what do we do? What do we do? Well, we'd be able to go to the, to the, uh, that one, right? But we'd need to do one more thing. That would take us to the even case, but there's something that we'd be left out. We can't say that, that for example, the multiplication of 19 in x is the same as the multiplication of 18 in x. We'd have to add one more x. And this, this is almost exactly what a computer does, this thing that we have written here. And we'll write this uh, next week in the lab. So have a nice, uh, have a nice Thursday.